this webinar. Uh, so this webinar is on WSO2 Identity Server 530. Uh, this is going to be a product release webinar. We released the product a couple of weeks back. So my name is Johan Nalathambi. I'm a technical lead uh, for the WSO2 Identity Server. And also with me, I have Darshana Gunavardhana, who is an associate technical lead for the Identity Server. So this is going to be our simple agenda for this webinar. So it's going to follow a standard format as with all our release webinars. So we'll give a very brief uh, uh, overview of what the WSO2 Identity Server is and what are the different uh, um, areas it caters. Uh, then we'll directly jump into what are the new features of uh, version 5.3.0. So if I give you a brief, we've concentrated on three key areas for the 5.3.0 release. The major uh, area that we focused on was uh, improved support for account and credential management uh, features. Uh, so we'll talk about that more in our slides. And then we have extended our support for the various open standards that WSO Identity Server uh, supports, uh, specifically in the area of OpenID Connect. So uh, that, again, we will talk more about uh, in the uh, coming slides. And then also we've improved our uh, analytics uh, with, with the addition of real-time security testing capabilities. And then uh, finally, we'll jump into uh, what's, what, what we are looking ahead, uh, the Identity Server 6.0 roadmap, and then we'll also have a Q&A session. So what is the WSO2 Identity Server? So this is how we define the WSO2 Identity Server. It's a free and open source identity and access management server. So these are some highlights of the WSO2 Identity Server 5.3.0. So 530, uh, it's in its fifth generation. So most probably this is going to be the last release in based on the Carbon 4 platform. So if you are familiar with the WSO2 Carbon platform, uh, currently, the Carbon platform is in version 4, and all our future releases are going to be on Carbon platform version 5, which is a complete uh, revamp of our platform uh, and a complete new redesign of uh, the, the architecture of how our products are built. So this might probably be the last release on Carbon 4. Uh, hereafter, we might release connectors, uh, service packs, and patches, but might not release it. Uh, feature uh, uh, feature version. Uh, as with all our products, our products are uh, WSO2 Identity Server is also 100% free and open source, so it's uh, free for you to download and try it. Um, uh, we have a, a, a commercial support model, so if you need production support, then you can buy support from WSO2. There are products are released uh, with uh, on Apache 2 license, uh, the most business friendly license you can get. Uh, like I said before, it's based on the WSO2 Carbon platform, which is uh, based on OSGI technology. Uh, so, um, and it's also built using Java. So it's a very componentized and modular architecture. Uh, and then the Carbon platform has inbuilt support for things like multi-tenancy logging, clustering, caching, security, etc. So these kind of cross-cutting features are provided by the platform. So all the products that are built using the Carbon platform leverage these features. It's very developer friendly, so there are a lot of uh, plug points, extension points in the product, so that you can, uh, if, if, if what the product provides out of the box is not suitable for your requirements, you can build a connectors, plugins, and extend the product, and also like use connectors to connect with legacy systems, etc., or proprietary systems, etc. Also, we've, we've got uh, APIs, uh, RESTful and SOAP APIs to integrate with your system. Uh, so not only that you can use our console, but you can also use our APIs and consume our um, features as services. Then all the uh, UIs are themable and customizable based on your uh, organizational requirements. And it's a very user-friendly product uh, with minimal learning curve. So our, our, all our products in the WSO2 Carbon platform follow a consistent UX. So if you if you are familiar with one product, 
uh, it's very easy for you to adapt to a different another product it's very lightweight and high performance so the pack itself is about 350 MB the download size the size of the distribution that you download and it can run um, uh, in very minimal uh, memory footprint then when it comes to deployment um, it's a container friendly deployment so you can use container technology such as docker or uh, you can build your Amazon AMI images and deploy them. Uh, you can use clustering technologies like Kubernetes or Mesos, and you can do a container-based deployment. Uh, that is, uh, it's it, it's very friendly when it comes to WSO2IS. <clears throat> then there is clustering support for high availability deployment, and also you can deploy the product on-premise. Uh, you can deploy it in your private cloud, and also WSO2 provides a managed cloud service where you can, uh, where we manage the deployment for you. So when we talk about the key capabilities of the identity server, these are the four key areas that the identity server is strong. Uh, so this is how I would categorize the features into. Uh, so enterprise and cloud SSO and federation. So when we talk about SSO and federation, we are talking about um, standards like SAML2 Web SSO, OpenID Connect, um, CAS, Central Authentication Service, WS Federation. So these are the uh, protocols that we are talking about in, uh, in uh, when it comes to cloud SSO and federation and also the identity server can work as a identity broker which can delegate uh, delegate and do federated authentication with external IDPs like social IDPs like Facebook Google and whatever proprietary IDP that you may have which supports one of the standards that I explained to you then uh, then the next Key area is strong authentication. So identity server can support multi-step and multi-factor authentication. So some of the uh, some of the uh, authentication connectors that we have are FIDO and uh, a time-based one-time password authenticator and many more authenticators. So if you want to have a, a list of uh, what are the various multi-factor authenticators that we support, you can visit our WSO2 public store. Uh, it's, uh, you can freely uh, download our connectors and try it out. So uh, apart from what the connectors that are shipped with the product, there are additional connectors that you can download and install to the product from the WSO2 store. And then uh, the third key area is identity governance and administration. So under these, uh, there are many, many uh, sub areas that we can talk about. We can talk about provisioning users, uh, deprovisioning users, uh, applying workflows, um, uh, um, approving requests, uh, things like that. Uh, so this is one area that we uh, heavily focused on uh, in the 530, 530 release and we'll talk about that in a minute. And then the last area I would call is entitlement and access control. So this is basically the authorization capabilities of the product. So in this area, we have support for role-based, permission-based, and attribute-based access control. And we support uh, uh, the standard uh, policy-based access control language called JACML. So let's uh, directly jump into what are the new uh, features with Identity Server version 5.3.0. So um, in case you want to know more about <coughs> the existing features of the identity server, the previous features of the identity server, I would recommend you to take a look at our previous webinars. There was a webinar for IS520 uh, in, uh, in which we went into a little bit more detail of the existing features. And then also we have our resources library where you can look at more articles, uh, previous webinars. Uh, then there are a lot of blogs around. So you can search on that and I would recommend you to read more on the identity server. So when it comes to IS530, we've added 37 new features and major improvements. So in the history of Identity Server, I would say that this is the uh, most feature-rich uh, Identity Server release as yet. So like I said before, we've concentrated on three key areas. 
So one is the redesigned account and credential management support, then the extended support for open standards, specifications, and then the real-time alerting capabilities. So regarding the account and password management support, so basically we had uh, uh, certain features uh, in this area in previous uh, releases as well. However, what we've done here is we've completely re-architected the way how uh, accounts and password management happens. So we've introduced the event-based uh, architecture. So for any kind of events that uh, occur, uh, on a on a on a identity of a user, we trigger certain events, and then there are a certain uh, there is a certain extension point called a handler, so which can listen to these events, and we uh, we implement we out of the box we provide a, a set of handlers which listen to certain events and then uh, and then do uh, certain um, certain actions, so. So the, the beauty of this architecture is that you can extend this framework by adding more handlers and listening to events and uh, implementing certain very complex uh, and uh, uh, unique uh, niche use cases. And also like we provided support for multi-tenancy. So in the IS520 version, we didn't have support for multi-tenancy when it comes to account and password management features. So things like locking accounts uh, and uh, password policies, etc., uh, you couldn't configure based on uh, the different tenants. So everything was a global level setting. But in 5.3.0, it's multi-tenanted. And uh, we've moved away from the file-based config in 5.2.0, and we've provided uh, UI-based configuration in 5.3.0. And also we've made the modules more uh, the, the 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 component more modular with uh, by implementing the handlers that I explained before. So in in that sense, those modules are more reusable. So in case let like, let's say for example, let's take an example scenario, right? So this scenario might not be uh, provided by identity server out of the box, but it's very easy to implement. So let's take a scenario like you have an existing user base, and now you are uh, introducing identity server into your organization ecosystem. And now you are going to plug in your user base to the identity server. And in this process, you are introducing a new password policy, and uh, which means that all the new users who are going to be added to the system will have to uh, comply with this password policy, the password complexity policy. Whereas the existing users in the in your user store or identity store might not comply with the password policy. So how can you overcome this uh, issue? So ideally what happens is for the existing users, you would allow them to log in for a certain time period and after that you are you force them to update their password. So basically whenever they log in, you show a particular warning saying that uh, you will have to update your password within a certain period of period of time and once that time elapses you will basically lock the account and after that if if he needs to update his password uh, after that if he needs to log in he basically needs to update his password uh, and then log in so this kind of a use case it cannot be achieved out of the box uh, and also it was hard to achieve uh, in the previous versions of identity server because there were there was a lot of code that you need to write but with the new model, uh, it can be simply achieved because the, the, there are a lot of reusable components, reusable modular components, for example, for sending emails, for locking the accounts, so on and so forth. There are reusable components. So with a bit of uh, code that you write to extend, you can achieve a much more complex and unique use cases. Then there are more restful APIs for account and credential management scenarios. So previously we only had SOAP APIs. So SOAP APIs was always a hassle. Uh, REST APIs are much more cleaner and a nicer way of integrating with your application. And then another major, uh, major improvement is that we provided out-of-the-box 
support out of the box UI for self sign up with email verification and also out of the box UIs for account recovery scenarios such as username recovery, password recovery with challenge questions, password recovery with email, so on and so forth. So these are earlier provided only with RESTful APIs, but right now we have it in the UI. And then when it comes to email templates, so this is another area that a lot of users were highly demanding. Uh, so basically, the, uh, earlier we couldn't add and manage our templates. Uh, you, we had a fixed set of templates which you could, could edit, but you could, could not add more templates for your custom scenarios. So now we can add more templates, any number of templates you want. And also there is HTML templating support, so you can format your email uh, with HTML tags. There is internationalization support, which means you can uh, you can uh, store templates for each uh, local, and the, the email which is sent to the user would be sent based on the user's preferred local. So if the user's preferred local is say Spanish, the email template in Spanish would be sent for him. So likewise, so that that's supported, and then also in the email templates we can have user attribute values. So earlier the the content was more or less static. You there were only few attributes, a few uh, properties that could be replaced in the template, such as username, the user store domain, and the tenant domain. Uh, we couldn't add user attributes as such, but now we can do that. We can replace. We can add the user's first name, last name, whatever user's attributes we can have as placeholders in the template and replace. And then also, uh, when sending the emails out, earlier we only had support for emails, but in 530 we integrated with our own uh, CEP output adapt engine. So CEP is WSO2 complex event processor, and it has an output adapt engine. And in that engine, there are several output transports. So which out of which email is just one transport, but there are a lot more transports like SMS, MQTT, Thrift, so on and so forth. So we, we are basically decoupling the transport from the notification content. So we decide on the content, and then we call our CEP engine to send the uh, notification out. So basically, you if you want new types of transports, you can use uh, the CP and configure that, or you can even write new transports uh, to be sent out. And then also we've uh, provided support for international internationalization of challenge questions. So even the challenge questions, uh, when, 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 when doing challenge questions based recovery of user accounts, the challenge questions that are shown to the user can be localized to the user's preferred uh, local. And then when it comes to brute force prevention, so that was something um, uh, we had earlier also, we had uh, uh, account locking. So whenever a user tries to enter invalid passwords and try to log in after a number of times, the account gets locked. Now we've improved that support by adding uh, a Google reCAPTCHA. So now you can say maybe after three times the user tries invalid password, uh, you should the, we should show a, a, a CAPTCHA verification for the user. And beyond that, another two times if the user still enters wrong password, after five times that is, the u account gets locked. So something like that. So you can, you can enable CAPTCHA as well as account locking. And also the CAPTCHA is integrated into not only login, but also into self-registration, the sign up, and also in recovery flows. So whenever a user tries to recover his uh, user, uh, his uh, password, that we can enable CAPTCHA. And then when it comes to more password policies, we introduced more features. So we've got password history validation. So which means to say that uh, a user's password, so whenever a user tries to update his password, he cannot use the last five passwords that he has used or the last 10 passwords that he has used. So that is password history validation. So that is provided out of the box. 
and then account expiry and automatic reminder. So that is to say that uh, if the user has not used this account for the past three months to log into the system, lock the user's account. And uh, and also periodically uh, we can send reminders to the user's email saying that you haven't used your account to login, please use, or your account will get locked permanently, something like that. So that's uh, that that's account expiry and automatic login reminder. Then we have admin initiated password reset. So in this case, basically what happens is the user requests the administrator to initiate a password reset. So password resets can be initiated in a couple of ways. So the, uh, the admin can initiate an email-based password reset, or he can initiate a OTP, a one-time code-based password reset to the email or the, or, the SM or, or the phone of the user, or else he can uh, initiate a password reset and uh, give, the, give the OTP over the uh, in, in, over the phone or in some other offline mechanism. So there are a couple of ways a password reset can be initiated. In either way, you provide a one-time code to the user, and whenever the user goes to login, he'll have to provide the one-time code first, and then he'll have to permanently update, the, update his password. So this is also another feature that we've added. And then also we've provided uh, the option to send emails for many more scenarios. So for example, whenever you start a username recovery or a, or a password recovery flow, we will send out an email. And whenever the password is updated, we will again notify the user that his password is updated. Whenever an account gets locked, we will notify the user the, password, the account has been locked, so on and so forth. Yeah, so from this point onwards, I will hand over to Darshana and he will uh, basically take you through the demo and the rest of the slides. Okay, thank you, Johan. Uh, so let's see how this uh, account and password management features work in a real, real scenario. Um, so, so here we have the identity server with the new features of the account login and credential management as you see in this uh, UI uh, there are like a new set of uh, uh, UI elements come to the resident identity provider section like you can configure enable or disable each of these features so here we have enabling enable the self registration and account locking and the uh, Google reCAPTCHA support for the demonstration purpose like and so once we have successfully enabled those features, let's go to the registration UI and we are going to register a new user called Darshan with the username. And then if you remember, like uh, in the earlier page, we have enabled the Google reCAPTCHA for the account uh, user registration so so it, it shows the like uh, from for the captcha verification process in the registration ui like so this this prevent any uh, any brute force attacks comes to the registration ui so you can see like uh, there are mails come uh, registration mail account confirmation mail come to the uh, the user's email address so here you can see like uh, so we have the uh, HTML templated email uh, sent here like uh, these there are, we can add like any images and any buttons or the uh, responsive UI elements you can send for this e email as the email from the WC admin server now like earlier we didn't have this support and one thing to note is like it's, uh, you can have the internationalized uh, like uh, not only the English or any you don't need, you don't need to limit it to one language like if the user have the correctly set the uh, local uh, cookie or the browser local elements like uh, user will get the his uh, email with in the uh, their local language using the identity server new features. 
So here we uh, click on the confirm registration link and uh, so we can see like uh, the user account is getting unlocked and once the user unlock we can log into the portal. Yeah, so uh, let's add uh, some uh, small feature like uh, let's uh, add, make this uh, scenario much more uh, uh, real scenario like for the, in, let's say in the organization you have uh, user cannot uh, simply register through the uh, uh, registration UI like uh, let's say you have to go through with some uh, uh, verification process so so in this case we are like uh, we can introduce the workflow to this uh, flow and and so we I have created the work, workflow for add user operation and I'm, I'm going to engage that workflow to the this user registration process so in that way so only the uh, approved user will get registered to the system and continue with the registration and uh, log into the system uh, or the user portal so the corporate applications you have so we are registering a new user here and again we have to go through the capture process so even though we create the user here if we go to the email and check we we did not receive any email from the user account confirmation email supposed to come but because like uh, this user is even though this user is registered it does not uh, went through the approval process so the uh, any privileged user has to go to or the admin or the manager uh, uh, privileged user has to go to the uh, approval uh, to the their portal and approve this user so I am as an admin user going to approve this user, uh, user called Johan and then so once the once we have approved that user we are getting an email or the that uh, that user who registered can, can continue with the registration process so I have uh, continue with the registration process and now the user new user can log into the portal yeah so likewise so you can see like uh, uh, all these new features can be um, uh, uh, like linked and uh, combined with the existing features of the identity server and then uh, achieve your like uh, company policies or the any restrictions with the user registration process much easily so now let's check on the brute force attack prevention for the uh, login flow like uh, so when I enabled the, uh, this identity governance features earlier like uh, I enabled the uh, captcha for the uh, account login as well uh, login in the login flow so, so once user has entered uh, two incorrect uh, login attempts they are from two uh, enter the capture or go through the with the capture process so here I have entered to initially the login attempts and, and then I had to go through with the capture process so now if so once you have the capture uh, entered correctly now you can win uh, and you have well, as, as long as you have the correct credentials you can log into the system now so not only the registrations you have the uh, password recovery with the all the, uh, the all the options we have earlier like uh, built into the this user portal in the out of the box like and not only the password recover username also you can uh, recovery also can be done in the uh, this new portal uh, much easily like uh, yeah so that's like the overall idea on the capabilities on the account and credential management of the 530 release and let's move, move to the uh, new uh, standards uh, or protocols we added in the 530 uh, 
so as you can see here, like uh, we added the OpenID Connect Discovery Support, uh, which is an uh, OpenID Connect so uh, DCR Dynamic Client Registration and uh, Post Response Form Post Response Mode than the Token Introspection Line. So if we like uh, describe on this, like uh, Discovery is like used to uh, automatically uh, identify the uh, authorization server capabilities and the endpoints and make the reliant parties uh, much easily uh, integrated with the any authorization server. So I didn't server added the uh, uh, OpenID Connect discovery support. So like any mobile applications or the uh, devices like that going to be dynamically registered to the ID authorization server now can use now can use this uh, discovery protocol to interact with the standard way like um, so then once you have discovered the uh, uh, authorization service capabilities and the endpoints now uh, to get access token you need to uh, register the auth application in the authorization server so the second protocol is dynamic client registration is used to that and uh, from that you can like uh, create Auth application or uh, and get the client ID and secret secret to uh, uh, generate Auth token in this protocol. So IDN Server 530 uh, the, do support the dynamic client registration, uh, Open ID Connect dynamic client registration with this way. So and the third one is like a, is a form post response mode. It's like uh, another way of uh, getting Auth. Uh, Access tokens like a, it's a separate profile for that. Uh, so this this is uh, uh, is like helpful for uh, like uh, to integrate with uh, .NET applications. There are some uh, plugins that can be uh, uh, that is uh, mandatory to use the form post response mode uh, be integrated with the, that kind of design party. So uh, so I didn't serve a 530 like uh, support for this form post, form post response mode as well. Um, then the, uh, the, the like uh, very powerful uh, feature like the, the token introspection support. So this is basically you, this is a standard way to uh, validate or token with, with the resource server and the authorization server like uh, so this is a trust built for between resource server and authorization to val validate those tokens. So we have added the auth token introspection support in the IDN server 530. So as you can see, like uh, so, this is uh, this diagram taken from the OpenID Connect site. Like uh, uh, so, now with the 530 release, IDN server supports all the uh, profiles with in the OpenID. Connect protocol suite complete uh, site. So basically, I uh, server 530 with the agent server 530, it do support OpenID protocol uh, complete suite. So uh, not not only the this uh, protocol suite, there are like uh, supplementary profiles as well. So likewise, JWT, similar to BR grant. So agent server do support those as well and with the NTLM grant. Line. So so basically, these features like make IDN server uh, uh, open ID and auth story much more comprehensive. And uh, next, uh, we have implement uh, introduced two protocol support for the SAML space. So SAML metadata profile. This is like heavily used interact when interacting with the uh, similar to IDPs and the service providers. Uh, so uh, identity server uh, added the both. Uh, so since identity server uh, can act as the similar to IDP as well as the similar to service provider. I didn't, uh, I, with this release, we have added the similar to metadata profile for both IDP and for service provider as well. That means like you can use identity server to get the IDP metadata uh, details and as well as 
you can get uh, the service provider service provider metadata details like and uh, so I didn't server do support so the with high three zero is we are supporting the accession query request profile so this is uh, like uh, uh, some uh, additional profile with the SAML 2 like uh, after you authenticate with the uh, SAML 2 IDP the service provider can uh, do a back channel call and get the additional details with the identity provider so uh, so you can find more details with uh, our blogs and the documents on this like uh, and and uh, we have added for the SACML and the authorization space. We have added the uh, SACML REST profile for the uh, identity server. Like uh, now, you can from the uh, SACML policy enforcement point. Uh, this is somewhat similar to the OAuth uh, token introspection uh, specification. Like uh, rather than uh, communicate and with communicate with the resource server and the authorization server. In the SACML, you have the policy enforcement point and the policy decision point. So uh, the, uh, this uh, SACML REST profile provides you a restful way to communicate with the uh, policy enforcement point and the policy decision point. So, um, so this, uh, it, this capability also added with the, this release. And uh, we have improved the uh, scheme 1.1 as well, and and we have some limitation on attribute querying in the scheme 1.1 implementation on the Azure server, and we made this uh, 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 limitations uh, go away with the this release. Like uh, now we can query the attribute without any issue with the scheme 1.1 implementations comes with the Azure server 530, and um we have uh, done uh, uh, like uh, revamp our uh, scheme core implementation and uh, uh, came up with the scheme 2 engine uh, and uh, we have revamp our scheme uh, core which is known as charon to support scheme 2.0 and we have tested with the iden server but it doesn't uh, comes out of the box with the uh, product itself like rather we ship going to be shipped with, uh, in the identity server connector store as a connector to identity server so still that not added to the store but uh, we are like uh, almost done with this testing and we are going through the final iterations on that so we can uh, find uh, so don't expect that uh, scheme to sub support on top of the identity server 530 and uh, rather, uh, apart from the uh, protocols and standards and we have uh, so added uh, 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 several other features as well uh, so this is somewhat interesting uh, capability of the uh, we added like uh, so now you can engage access control policies from the uh, to the authentication flow like uh, so this is a uh, uh, key request we got from several parties from our uh, different customers to like uh, engage different uh, access control policies for in, in in middle of the authentication flow like uh, as given in the example so like you can now uh, with, uh, now uh, uh, you can now say like uh, only allow so you can restrict your corporate employees to log in to their applications uh, uh, like uh, after their office hours or uh, or like uh, you can uh, uh, allow the access only for the internal network likewise so so uh, you let's say you have organization and those uh, let's say banking system so you need to uh, allow access those to those application only from the uh, their office hours or, or else uh, for like uh, say uh, guys from the uh, internal IT might wanted to access outside the office hours but still you want to access from the internal network so so these kind of uh, requirements can achieve with this uh, ability, uh, this uh, new feature uh, that's because like um, uh, we based so this, this 
uh, authentication policies like uh, this access control policies are we, we can, our default implementation is SACML. Uh, so we call our uh, SACML engine to get these decisions and SACML provides like a uh, uh, like, uh, powerful way to uh, do fine grain access control. So, and, and we can write any uh, any uh, policy to like uh, based on the runtime data or the environment data, runtime data such as the uh, who is the authenticated user or what are the, what that user's attributes or the environment data like uh, where the, this uh, uh, authentication request is coming or what is the time and what is the geolocation, such kind of uh, environment details. You, you can like uh, uh, write policies, access control policies with, with any uh, as as long as long as you need like with the any number of fine grain policies, um, so not all, so we have an extensible way to uh, control uh, communicate with the rule engine. So it's not coupled with the our SACML implementation. You can uh, uh, if if the you have like your own rule engine to get these decisions, uh, it can be connected from our extension points. So, and we have our uh, templated policies to like uh, cover common use cases uh, that many of, many, 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 many customers need, need in their production systems like uh, uh, the user store based or the role based or the uh, time based. So we, we came up with like default policies to like cover the most common scenarios. So uh, any, you can use those default policies uh, to enable these uh, uh, authorization decisions or like, uh, do, so you don't need to like uh, have the knowledge of uh, SACML or any, uh, any SACML specific uh, knowledge to write your own policies, you can just, uh, uh, use these templated policies and change your values to as you need. So that's basically uh, for the access control policies for the authentication flow. And similarly, we have a, uh, a similar feature for the uh, provisioning as well. Uh, for let's say you need, you need a, you have a requirement like uh, only for uh, users from this department and uh, from this geolocation uh, provision or sync users to uh, this particular uh, application. Say you have a, like a, you have a, a marketing people from the uh, or sales people from the uh, North American region and there, uh, there is like a specific government uh, application you need to sync your employees to for with the sales detail in the sales department, and you can uh, similarly engage the access control policies or the uh, in the provisioning flow and uh, uh, write uh, or enable uh, uh, policy with that uh, particular rules, and and only the users with that region will then only get sync with that particular government uh, application. So. Likewise, uh, so it's more, it's more, it's very similar to the the previous one. Basically, uh, it's only difference is like where the uh, police, where the uh, policy enforcement is done. Earlier, it's uh, in the middle of the authentication flow. Now, it's in the middle of the uh, uh, user management flow, like uh, user operation flow. So then we have like a uh, uh, few other uh, features as well, like uh, um, uh, found for the missing predefined user attributes in the authentication flow. Like, uh, so we have seen that uh, when integrating with uh, uh, some uh, service providers, they are like requesting like uh, mandatory uh, mandatory attributes for particular users, like say, uh, when I wanted to connect to a uh, GitHub, let's say GitHub, so uh, 
we i need to it's it's an uh, mandatory to have the email address for my users but uh, in my system it's not a mandatory attribute to have my uh, users to have the email address so but to interact with the github i need to have the email address for my users and let's say you have a jira and jira requires like uh, some other uh, attribute let's say uh, let's say age uh, so the jira need uh, jira is to interact with jira you need to uh, have the age as the mandatory attribute for the user so uh, similarly there are uh, use cases like this we can we had like uh, requested and then there are we had a way to uh, implement or the uh, achieve this but uh, they are need to be done through the uh, implementing our extension points now but with this release we it can be done from the ui and the in the same simple configurations like uh, you can enable uh, missing attributes or you can define okay connect uh, in, in in order to interact with uh, jira uh, age is a mandatory attribute then then when in the authentication flow it would prompt you to add the uh, uh, age parameter if you haven't already added and um, next one is like uh, we have seen uh, there are uh, scenarios where uh, uh, when some employees leave the company or some um, security breach done on the applications your client uh, secret getting revealed to the outside or the unintended parties in that then you need to uh, create regenerate the client secrets in your systems to continue with the, those applications so we we didn't had a direct way to implement that and with the new release we have uh, those capabilities with, uh, to regenerate revoke existing application uh, client secrets in existing application and regenerate with a new secret and uh, the next one is like uh, uh, earlier uh, in order to have the iwa support uh, uh, to try out the iwa like uh, wso to ies uh, uh, need to be in the uh, Linux uh, Windows Server, Windows Server machine. So now, now we have added the capability of like uh, it doesn't need to be identity server to uh, deploy on the Windows machine. Rather, you can deploy on the Linux uh, server or like any uh, any Unix system and then connect with the uh, connect to the AD and uh, connect to uh, try out the IW authentication and um, we have added the uh, uh, improvements to the our claim management as well so now it's uh, like uh, you have the concept called uh, local claims and uh, which can be which is the root claim dialect of the identity server and you have a concept called uh, foreign uh, uh, custom claims like uh, which is depends on the root claim root claim dialect and and then uh, there are like uh, many uh, sim, this this makes the uh, complex uh, this uh, uh, removes the complexities when uh, transforming and uh, use attributes from one dialect to another and uh, likewise and uh, 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 in this chunk with the final it is like uh, uh the generic uh, support for the authentication authorization for the rest API, like so when we interact with the identity server let's say we as we said earlier there are like uh rest apis to the identity governance features and identity server has many other rest apis as well so so there is a extensible way to uh, change the authentication and authorization mechanism in the identity server so let's see a small demo on uh, how these features uh, comes with the uh, act in the WC running server. So we have small demo created for you. So let's 
so basically uh, here we are have a simple user and uh, doing the using the SAML authentication in the admin server and uh, so here what we are going to do is like uh, enable uh, some claims to be mandatory and uh, then it will get uh, request that will those will get prompt in the authentication flow then um, so we make the uh, email address and mobile in the mandatory for the travel city service provider so uh, so earlier it didn't ask for anything but once we made it mandatory now it's getting from it's asking user to enter those details and then only it uh, can be logged into the travel city service provider so uh, so let's enable the uh, the uh, authorization rule for this uh, travel city service provider so we have this same templated policies here so what i'm going to do is like uh, for this service provider i'm going to uh, say like uh, only admin uh, user with admin role can uh, log into the system so 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 the application name needs to be travel city and I'm going to publish that policy to the PDP and enable the rule this uh, so the access control for the authentication so here I am specifying okay use uh, enable authorization for this application so say uh, the time out there so now I trying to log with Pulaski so I'm getting an authorized fail uh, login here so since I Pulaski is not in the uh, role of admin he get not, he did not able to proceed with the uh, authorization uh, section like uh, since we have added that uh, authorization rules so earlier and uh, for the last part like uh, this is the new security analytics capability so I didn't server in the earlier with the 5.2 release we added the analytics capabilities and it's mainly focused on the monitoring which is like uh, uh, what's happened in the past now with the adding server 530 release we added the real time ca analytics capabilities and now users can or the admin can see what real time happened in the its adding provider and and we have added uh, two features there like uh, uh, one can uh, identify uh, suspicious login activities like uh, so let's say user one try like trying to uh, with the incorrect login attempts uh, multiple times and then uh, with the short time of short period of time you that user get uh, able to log into the system so so that 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 is a bit suspicious so uh, so we, we can enable uh, alerts for that and the abnormal user sessions uh, so that means like uh, let's say uh, users lo the, in the corporate environment uh, if the employees like uh, uh, tend to uh, have their average uh, user session for let's say uh, four hours or five hours time uh, so let's say they are they, let's say for a user darshana uh, the average user session is four hours 
and then in suddenly you you get the for the same user darshana uh, of a user session like uh, eight hours or twenty hours. So that is suspicious. So that is abnormal. So you can enable alerts for those kind of uh, 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 inconsistencies, like uh, or the suspicious uh, activities. And uh, we have uh, user sessions monitoring with the this release. Like uh, from there are two uh, uh, perspectives for this feature. Like at, for admin can monitor what are the uh, Active sessions in the system, and uh, for admin, it can uh, terminate those uh, uh, user sessions if needed. And for the user perspective, there are user can log into the portal and see what are the active login uh, in the system and terminate any uh, unwanted uh, active logins. Uh, um, let's say for from the mobile device you wanted to kill kill that session, you can do from the login portal. Yeah, so basically that's the uh, main features we have. Like, um, let's go for the last demo, uh, which is on the analytics. So, so we are logged into the analytics server. So, so I have so uh, with the Iden server file two, we have two distributions, uh, WSO2 core distribution, uh, IS core distribution, and the analytics distribution. Here you are seeing the analytics portal of the identity server. So here I have a user called Ashen, which has uh, and Ashen is having like a, uh, a login duration for like a very little amount of time, two seconds or three seconds. And uh, so if we check on the suspicion login alert. We don't have uh, abnormal login sessions. We don't have any. Uh, so I'm not going to uh, log into the some application uh, app I have. So and I'm gonna be uh, logging to that app to keep logged in for some time. So so as I as we seen earlier that. Uh, Use Ashen had only uh, its average is very little amount of time, uh, like two or three seconds. So we can see the our new session here with the live, uh, the second row. Um, so I'm going to show like uh, how this uh, uh, analytics feature is configured. Uh, so we have the long session. Uh, template here. So it say like uh, if the user has the threshold having uh, more than five percent of his average, uh, generator uh, alert here. So so let's go to the template manager and then this is the uh, email notification section. Like uh, so here we are saying like. Uh, if there is a suspicious activity, uh, send a email to the, the mentioned email address. So we have keep log. Ashen has been logged in uh, like enough time now. Like uh, so, as you can see, uh, uh, it's the now it should be uh, way below than the average value. Uh, now let's log in, log out from the application and let's check uh, what is the value now. Okay, so we have like a new entry added, uh, added here, like uh, with the much larger value than his average. So if we go to the abnormal session alert uh, UI now, we can see like uh, Ashen uh, have the uh, abnormal session activity go detected, and there is an email sent sent with that uh, detail. And uh, the second part is for the uh, 
abnormal login. So here it's saying like uh, 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 for the uh, abnormal login. So if the user try to uh, login failures within uh, two two minutes duration and uh, after two invalid login failures, if the user able to successfully log into the system, uh, it's a, I say it's an abnormal scenario here. So here now I'm going to try that one. So I uh, tried with the one invalid login and the second one. And to be safe, I'm trying to do the third as well. Now I'm going to try with the correct password. So here we have uh, the the one in the in each every uh, login attempts we can see the uh, we can see the uh, analytics capabilities there like it get uh, triggered and uh, logged in the system and you can monitor those details in the uh, login attempts area on the admin server analytics dashboard so now you can see like uh, Success login also gets triggered, and uh, we have the uh, uh, user called Darshana uh, as identified as a suspicious login, alert, uh, and I got the email as well. So <clears throat> this is basically the analytics capabilities we have. Uh, so I'll hand over the presentation to Johan to uh, continue with the six hour plans. Yeah, thank you, Darshana. So I know we are running short of time, and there are a couple of questions also that we've already got. So I'll very quickly run through these slides. So very briefly, I already told that uh, we are uh, moving away from the Carbon 4 platform to the Carbon 5 platform. So let me highlight the key differences uh, when it comes to the Carbon 5 platform. So we are completely moving away from SOAP-based uh, product APIs to RESTful product APIs. Uh, we don't have Axis 2 anymore. There was a tight coupling to Axis 2 in the Carbon 4 generation, but uh, we don't have uh, Axis 2 as a tight dependency in Carbon 5. Uh, we'll no, no more have Tomcat with servlet transport, so we don't rely on Tomcat as the container. We have uh, the Carbon 5 kernel starts with Neti transport. Uh, and there are the native containerization support with Docker, and we are moving away from the in-JVM multi-tenancy to a container-based multi-tenancy. So basically, a container will run on behalf of a tenant. So if there's a new tenant that's spawning, there'll be a new container that spawns. And then we have support for JAX-based authentication and authorization. First-class support for groups, which was missing for a long time in the identity server. We had users and roles and permissions, but not groups. Groups are a set of users, uh, and that we will support from C5. We, have, we will have hierarchical groups and hierarchical roles. Concept of uh, a user domain. So basically what the user domain is, like uh, so a user's attributes, his identity can come from several user stores or identity stores. Uh, certain, a set of his attributes can come from identity store A and set of attributes can come from identity store B. But then we have to represent that user as a single identity. So that's where we introduce a concept of a domain uh, which which uh, which uh, which combines all these attributes from various identity stores and represent him as a single user. Then we also have a separation of identity store, credential store, and authorization store, uh, which allows a single user to be constructed from multiple uh, stores. Then we have scheme two based user group management, like Dustin explained. In, right now it will be a connector, but in C5 it will be the first class user management API. IS600. Then we also have an immutable ID concept for the users, which makes usernames uh, users renameable. So in the C4 generation, we couldn't rename our usernames. It was fixed forever. It was immutable. But in C5, we can rename the users. And we won't have the uh, our, our old carbon management console. Instead, we will have uh, different portals. Uh, for example, we will have the admin portal. Uh, for user management operations, 
uh, and etc. And the user portal for uh, users to come in, ma manage their identities, update their password, manage their secret questions, uh, manage their devices, etc. So likewise, we may have uh, other portals as well based on the uh, different roles that the user, business users may play in an organization. For example, maybe to approve certain workflows or approve certain requests, we might have an approval portal, likewise. And then we also want to give a extension mechanism based on JavaScript. Right now, all the extensions need to be written using Java. We want to uh, make it easy for uh, developers to write extensions using JavaScript. And then also we want to introduce a concept of circles. Circles are mainly for two reasons. Two, one is to apply configurations in bulk fashion to multiple service providers, and then also to have multiple sessions for a single user. So basically, a single user can have multiple sessions uh, 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 shared between a uh, different uh, group of service providers. So you basically group the service providers and create a session for that group. So we can have multiple groups of service providers. So single sign-on and single logout will happen only within that group. And then also certain other uh, architectural level um, improvements, which I have listed out, which I don't want to go into a lot of detail into. But uh, we, 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 if you want to know more about what's happening around IS6 and Carbon 5, I would uh, recommend you to um, subscribe to our architecture mailing list of WSO2 and get to know more. And also, uh, come uh, in, in, in the future, we will uh, definitely update with uh, more content in our website and uh, and webinars uh, of uh, what are the new developments in around IS6. So I think that's uh, all we have for the webinar content. Uh, we can go for the Q&A session. So there is a question on uh, can HTML templates to be specific to tenants or same for all tenants like so uh, with this release, like uh, we have uh, UI for, uh, you can configure for e different email templates for different tenants, like uh, uh, you can add uh, uh, any number of templates, email templates, so the, that, that, that uh, this, all these configuration we described earlier, like uh, are, can be configured for each tenant, like uh, different tenants can have different configurations. So, uh, yes, uh, email templates can configure differently for each tenant. Um, so, monitoring login user sessions need to have analytics enabled. Yeah, so it's uh, basically using analytics, uh, like uh, analytics server uh, uh, data to retrieve those session details. So basically to monitor login sessions, you need to have the uh, analytics distribution also configured and connected correctly. Um, so what is the proposed way to SSO for Windows domain? Yeah, so the question is, what is the proposed way to do SSO for a user of a Windows domain while the IS is running on Linux? IS will be used in combination with APIM, API Manager, and both are hosted on Linux. Would it be feasible to move the IS to Windows and leave the APIM on Linux? Yeah, so actually, uh, even in our earlier releases, IS could run on a Windows domain. It was just that IS couldn't run on a Linux machine. But with the 5.3.0, IS can run on a Linux machine, so and it can provide um, integrated Windows authentication for all your Windows users. So that should be possible. Uh, do all password policies and authentication features on par for LDAP and RDBMS user stores? Uh, RDBMS had few features in 5.0. Uh, for example, no password reuse enforcement. I had to write custom authenticator. Yes. So in IS530, all the password policies are on par for LDAP and RDBMS. There is no difference uh, with regard to the implementation for LDAP and RDBMS. Uh, it, it's, it's, actually done. it's actually implemented at a different level, so it doesn't really matter whether you are using a LDAP or RDBMS uh, as the underlying user store. So it should work uh, the same for both. 
uh, are the dashboards responsive now? Jacks were, Jacks were kind of junky in 5051. Okay, so uh, yeah, so the dashboard, the UIs you would have seen in the videos uh, Darshana showed, showed uh, uh, are completely uh, different from uh, 50. So they are more, uh, you know, responsive and uh, they can they suit well for mobile uh, mobile devices, tabs, and so on and so forth. So they are responsive. They are much better in the latest releases. Can uh, authorization policy require two-factor auth based on location or time? Yeah, uh, so this one uh, is falls into the category of adaptive authentication. So right now I would say we don't, we, we are not strong in that area as yet. I mean out of the box, but if we, if we re require it to be done, we can do it using extensions. A lot of our customers are doing it by writing certain extensions. Uh, but right now, out of the box, we don't support it. And maybe with IS6, like I explained, with the JavaScript extension model and stuff, it will be even more easier to do it. But of course, we are uh, we are planning to support it out of the box uh, in the recent future. Uh, is it possible to protect applications that are not federation compatible? For example, they use only HTTP headers to identify the user or access rights. Um, so that depends. Uh, so I, I don't think I can give you a, a concrete answer. We might need to look at uh, uh, what kind of protocol they use. Uh, but however, from from IS perspective, we can write inbound authenticators and outbound authenticators. So uh, by writing inbound and outbound authenticators, we can basically uh, handle any kind of HTTP request. Uh, so we might have to get more detail regarding the specific uh, requirement uh, to give a um, give an accurate answer. But yeah, but there is no no real dependency on a standard protocol or standard federation protocol. We can support any custom protocol or proprietary protocol. That's no issue. Yeah, I think uh, that's all the time we have. If you missed any questions or if you have any further questions, please uh, send it to our email. Uh, so it can be found in the slides. Um, uh, mine, mine is johan at wsudo.com and uh, darshan at wsudo.com. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, and also if you have more questions, you can always uh, send to our dev, dev at wsudo.org mailing list. So the IES team is very active in the dev mailing list. So you can send it to that and we will answer as soon as possible. Yeah, so thank you everyone for joining this webinar. I hope this was an interesting session and you got to know more about the Identity Server 530 release and all the new features you get out of it. Uh, until we meet you again in another interesting webinar, uh, goodbye and have a nice day.